Hi again, guys. Um, this uh, this video is a little bit of a mix of a few things. So it's um, it's from when I left La Paz on the ferry, the Baja ferry, to go to Mazatlan. Uh, you can see the room here that I had. It was a pretty cool room, you know. Um, uh, a lot of people, when I was researching, everyone was talking about the nightmares that they had. There's me with about 20 days growth, not looking very good. That's guy Leo from uh, Leo's Baja Oasis. I've spoken about him in previous ones. And I can't remember this guy's name, but he was a fisherman. He was the fisherman guy. He was a cool, cool dude. And this is, um, this is the morning um, on, the, on the ferry ride. Basically, all these birds, there was little fish jumping out of the water, and these birds just kept flying and just diving into the water. It was pretty spectacular. And not only that, with that, there was hundreds of dolphins. Uh, and you'll see a few of them coming up shortly. But I had a great experience. Like, um, I, the, the, um, the ferry was really cool, and um, I had basically no issues at all. Um, with the whole process. Uh, I got my vehicle import permit in in La Paz uh, at the ferry terminal. There's a there's a um, there's an immigration office there uh, where you can get your, uh, get your vehicle import permit. You can get it when you first come into Mexico and I actually went sort of went through the process there as well but I didn't actually get it. Um, and uh, yeah it's a it's a I think this is where some of the birds still is it? Um, yeah, these are the dolphins. They were, they were everywhere. They started jumping up and then I stepped, looked out further to see and they were jumping everywhere over there. They were just, it was, there was hundreds of them. It was crazy. Um, but it was fantastic, you know. Um, there they are. All, uh, it was pretty hard to get all of them jumping out at once, but uh, I think my hand's getting in the way there. But they were, they were basically just jumping everywhere. Everywhere I looked they were popping out of the ocean. Um, I think they were only little ones, but it was uh, it was pretty spectacular. You can see them in the distance there jumping out, but they were just everywhere following the boat in. It was pretty cool. I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> they were just freaking everywhere. Um, but it was a pretty cool experience. Um, so yeah, so the, the actual ferry ride was, uh, so what I did was, you know, they jumped in everywhere, geez, that was beautiful. Not bad to wake up to first thing, first light in the morning to have all that happening around you. So basically a few days beforehand I went to the ferry terminal and got my vehicle import permit, got all the paperwork, you have to pay 400 US dollars for a motorbike, but you, ch you want to check out your, you want to check out on uh, Baja Bound, it'll give you the different pricing depending on what uh, that's coming into Mazatlan. Um, it depending on what make what year model you, your bike and what the the CCs are or something like that. I can't really remember. Um, to check it out online, you have to have cash or credit card. That's the only thing they'll accept. If you give them cash, you get. This is one of the guys I met on the boat. He was leaving his bike there and having to fly back for some reason. I can't remember what the reason he gave. And this, so this is me uh, heading uh, into Mazatlan um, and uh, actually just going for, I was pretty early, so it was 11 o'clock I arrived at my hotel, I couldn't get in there until like th two or three, so I just basically went for a ride and then came back. I rode at this highway for a little while, then went and got some gas, filled up the bike. Um, but um, yeah, so basically a few days before at the La Paz Ferry Terminal, I, I went and got my um, I, I went and just checked it out and the guys there were really helpful because the, the, when the ferry is not running there's lots of uh, um, so when the ferry is not running there's uh, you know the immigration guys are still there at the border check control and stuff like that so you, that's the best time to go up and you can talk to my other really good guy uh, who helped me out Xavier, Xavier uh, who helped me out a good young guy on the border he'd only been there for a little while and he just said oh you just got to go over to the office there so I went to the office with all my documents and my um, tourist card. So you need to have your, just get copies of your passport, registration, driver's license, uh, tourist, have your, have your original tourist card, um, and your passport, all that sort of stuff. You go there, they fill, you fill in a whole heap of documents, um, and then you 
give them the money and then you go and next door you've got to, you've got to make a couple of copies and you go next door to the copy or something like that. And, uh, and then you get them and you come back and then you get your sticker. Now, they didn't ask me, when I got to the border, the, the immigration guys, uh, a couple of days later, they didn't ask me to put the sticker on the bike. They just said, just keep it on you, just don't lose it. Um, it's registered in the computer system, so I imagine if you do lose it, it's going to be a pain in the ass, but I never got once asked for it. The only time I, I didn't even get asked for it when I left, I actually handed it in and I got my money. Um, so that was a pretty, pretty seamless sort of process. Um, but yeah, I got on the ferry. The only trouble was, you know, when I got to the ferry, I, you know, I was on the, I was on the boat within 30 minutes of getting there um, because it wasn't a busy day, maybe 10, 20% full. And then what I did is uh, they weigh your bike um, and then you go from there and they just direct you onto the boat. The only issue, I had a dickhead guy in front of me that just stopped on the ramp, so I was basically on a massive incline with my bike and all the gear on it, which I wasn't too happy about. Um, he just basically stopped there and just left me hanging behind. Um, it's quite a nice city actually, quite pretty. Uh, I've only stayed there for a um, yeah, and then I drove my bike on and then basically I, I bought all these straps to put, strap the bike up. They said, oh no, no, they put me in a spot I didn't have anywhere to strap to anyway. So I just put it on the centre stand, which is a pain in the backside of my bike, by the way. Um, put on the centre stand and and then I, the problem was is you have to carry your gear upstairs and I was already sweating like a pig. And then I had to carry all the, all the bags upstairs um, separately. No one gave me a hand or anything, which, you know, it's fine, but... You know, I would have given someone 10 bucks if they would have helped me, but I put my gear, took, took the gear, important gear off first, and then uh, went upstairs and spoke to a person. They said they'll look after it while, while I'm getting the rest. Then I went down and got the rest of the gear, came up, and then I had to pay, because uh, I had a room, and I got a room with a balcony, which I would suggest you get, because it's really nice if you're getting seasick or anything like that, which I, I haven't for 30 years. I can't remember the last time I got seasick. But um, if you are like that, it's probably best to get somewhere where you can stand outside. You can stand on the, on the, on, at the top anytime you want as well. If you're roughing it, you don't have to do this, but I have to go to the front desk, get my ticket stamped, and then also get pay $20 for a security deposit for the remote control and, and my key for my cabin. Um, with, the, with the ticket, I got a, um, I got a free meal and um, it was pretty basic, but it was nice, you know, it was okay. And then I sat down with a, a, this Aussie couple who were travelling on uh, by their, um, their four-wheel drive. They are travelling south a lot slower than me. I don't even think they're you know, out of Central America yet. Um, uh, you know, that's six months they've been going. But they were really cool people, a guy and a girl. And, and then there's another guy that I met who was riding his motorbike, but he was dropping it off and having to go back somewhere. He had to get somewhere fairly fast, so he was leaving straight away. But he was a pretty cool dude, and uh, he yeah, talked a little bit about what he's been doing and where he's been going. Um, and um, yeah, so basically, I spent one night in Mazatlan, and then I was heading to Puerto Vallarta for uh, for two nights in Puerto Vallarta, which is a bit of a tourist town, but it's a really cool little place. Uh, it's quite pretty. Um, my only problem was, is I booked. I thought I'll get something nice. This is still Mazatlan. Um, I'll get something nice for a couple of nights, you know, and uh, and then so somewhere I can sit on a balcony and I can actually plan my plan my trip. And I did that, and I got a nice place. My only problem was I didn't realise it was uh, the, the when I got there in the front desk it was a pretty bit of a party place. But not only that, it was they they basically marketed to uh, gays and uh, lesbians, and and so I was there amongst probably in the swimming pool probably about 40 or 50 gays that were around the pool. It didn't worry me, but I just thought it was quite funny. Um, they kept themselves and uh, I, didn't, I didn't really speak to anyone there, just as well as all that sort of stuff. Then I went onto the beach and had a bit of a swim on the beach there, it was really nice. Um, yeah, just basically relaxed. I was going to go and do some tourist thing or something on a, on a, on a, on a boat, but then I thought, look, I've got, I've got a lot of riding ahead of me. And uh, yeah, so the thing about it is, is that I spent so much time in, in the past that I uh, I really wanted to get back on the bike and do some serious miles. And I spent probably 10, 
10, I think 7 or 10 days in the pads, um, which was fantastic. Yeah, this road was the, the first road that I got on was pretty narrow and pretty busy, um, a pretty busy road, but uh, it's very pretty riding, like lots of tw twists and turns, and it was good fun. Um, yeah, it takes a little while to get used to um, get used to the roads here because you've got to be pretty careful all the time because of the just because the roads are nice and then they're, all of a sudden they're just bad. You know, <laughs> so you can't really just give it the gun, give it the beans uh, on these sort of twisties, you know. But it's, it's great fun riding. It was pretty hot too. That was the only other thing too. So whenever I stopped, I just started sweating up. Uh, but I was getting, I was getting smarter about how I set myself up each day for the ride, as far as my riding gear. You know, with the climb, you can you can open up the some panels and get some air through there. Um, it's not going to help. Never helps me once I get to a city because you've got a lot of gear on. It's uh, 90, 90, 90, 95 and, you know, um, 30, 35 Celsius, you know, um, so it is pretty warm. But uh, it, it, was, it was a pretty nice ride. The only, the only issues I had was little times like this where I was just stuck behind a, a row of cars and, you know, you really just got to just bide your time. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a nice ride. And, and, so basically, um, the, once, you, once I got into Mazatlan, they didn't even check any of the paperwork that I had. And, uh, you know, so the whole time you're always worried about making sure you've got everything. you still got to do it because if you get pulled over, a lot of the times, especially the local police, they'll just look for a reason to do something to it, depending on the nationality you're on the if you're, um, if, you're, if you're American, you're probably, you're probably going to be a little bit tougher for them. But um, I had a I had a, a really good ride day. The Porta Vallada is uh, it's on a on a bit of a mountain top, There's sort of mountains around it, and so the hotel I stayed in was pretty much on a cliff. And it was a bit dicey getting up there. And, uh, and the day that I left it had rained the night before, and the cobblestones were slippery as all hell. Um, so you just got to I had to be a little bit careful getting down there because uh, you just no braking. You just got to use the accelerator. Hope you don't slip. Um, used to gear in. Um, but I had a good time there and there I went into the town. Again, so the old part of town is very pretty. There's a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, tourists there. And this wasn't the high season too, so I can only imagine once the high season begins that it gets pretty crazy there. Um, you know, because it's sort of uh, it just looked like one big party city. And I know that they had some issues there with security and, and stuff like that, but I never had any issues. Um, and the thing is, I never had any issues really on the whole trip, but I never, never ever feared at any time, never felt unsafe. Um, but I see stick to a few principles, like my, my basics were um, ride during the day, never try never to be in a rush, so never having to do, you know, get somewhere quickly. It's not always avoidable, but it's it's a smart way to do it. And the only way to do that is to plan your ride day and say, okay, it's a five-hour riding riding trip, and it's going to take me eight hours. Um, it's that's the only way to do it because if you if you're having to go extra, especially on the roads in Central and South America, and even in Mexico, if you're having to push it, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Um, you know, just because so many cars cut corners and stuff like that, it's, you know, um, it, it's basically, uh, you, you live by the rule where you just got to get out of the way when people are in your way and, you, you know, um, the bigger, bigger things rules, so trucks will, trucks will bit their horn before going around a corner, but, you know, it's, sometimes you don't hear them very well. So it's just always to, I always sit on the first third, going around a corner, try to anyway, um, on, on the big twisties where I know there's a lot of trucks. Yeah, but you'll find all the way through Mexico, through all the little towns and that, you can stop off anywhere and just, as long as you, I always pick a place like uh, local foodies places, um, so like street food, I always pick those places to go because, mainly because uh, it's always fresh, you know, it's always fantastic. Uh, I, I trust a street street vendor 10 times more than a, than a, than a restaurant. 
to have fresh food because they've got to, they've basically got to cook what they what they have each day. And usually they're very very popular with the locals. So if they're popular with the locals, you know that they they've got the the food's food's good stuff. You know? um, so I always. Just have, I didn't have too much to eat while I was riding. I never wanted to get full because I get tired when I, when I eat too much. Well, I have too, you know, if it's too uh, heavy fat inside like foods, I get pretty tired and I just don't I want to be alert while I'm on the road. Um, yeah, I much prefer those twisties in these type of roads. Though, but a lot of time I can't avoid it. You get a lot of these sort of dents um, throughout, you know, uh, different different parts of. Uh, Mexico. In Mexico you've got to pay for all the tolls if you're on a motorbike. A lot of the countries you don't. Um, but um, anytime the country's a little bit more advanced and they, you know, in Mexico I found that you had tolls everywhere, sometimes in ridiculous spots. This is me trying to get freaking money out of my pocket. Um, you, you, you could drive for five miles, ten miles, and all of a sudden there's another toll because it's, I don't know whether it's run by a separate company. And some of the roads were so bad, I was thinking, what do they put their money that they make from the tolls in? Because they're definitely not putting it on the roads. Um, you know, and it's usually the, the heavy trucking zones and the roads are really, really bad. Um, but yeah, tolls are a bit of a pain. You, you basically just got to, you know, you, if you're paying with cash, you just you end up with a truckload of change at the end of the day. <clears throat> and um, it's best to have it in your tank bag, but if you're wearing protective gloves, it makes it very hard. Like you've got to basically take your glove off. You know, I don't know why cars jump behind motorbikes now because it takes me probably 30 seconds longer to get through than a, than a car does. But it's, um, you know, it's just something you've got to put up with. Local on their motorbike, you see a lot of those too. Some sometimes they're carrying a ridiculous amount of stuff. But yeah, look if you, oh look, I suggest with with the with why I planned everything is if I was going to go onto a ferry, it was a hundred dollars or fifty dollars for a ticket with no bed, and it was a hundred dollars with a bed and one hundred and twenty with with a with a balcony. I just just every now and then I just I worked on about a hundred dollars a night. Um, staying and then there's plate so this if you budget it you can say well look okay there's going to be 15 20 places you're going to stay at 20 dollars a night you know the little intermediary places like the one night stuff so you if I was staying somewhere for one night I would normally um, just just get whatever like a, a hostel with a private room I never I never sleep in the dorms because you've got to protect your gear and all the all the issues that as I said before that all the issues people have that I met traveling were when they stayed in hostels um, and some people just have to because they're on a tight really tight budget but I basically worked on hundred dollars a day and so that's three grand a month basically and, and a lot of the time I was spending twenty twenty five dollars for, for a hostel you know um, so I basically just uh, if I had like five nights in a hostel, that would give me another 400, so I could actually splurge every now and then. So I mean, it, accommodation becomes your most expensive item by far. Um, I mean, I have to work, so I, I need to stay in hotels and, and need a good internet. I try to get good internet connections everywhere, so I had to do a fair bit of research each time and look at what all the comments were about the Wi-Fi all that sort of stuff before, you know, probably to, to book each place for me, except for the cabanas, where I just ride up, um, that's the, the, uh, the hotel I'm staying in, in the of um, but, you know, I'll plan it, look at all the comments that people make, and if people have negative comments about Wi-Fi, they're scrapped, I wouldn't stay there. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just get really, like in, in Argentina and Chile, the southern parts of that, it was terrible, the internet, it was really frustrating and you know basically I'm spending half my time in internet cafes because the hotel that said they had high speed internet didn't even have enough the internet good enough to download a web page, you know, to view a web page. So it's all about planning, so I, I probably spent about, I think I nearly, I, I nearly spent $20,000 on hotels, which is a lot, you know. Uh, 
the, the next the next uh, pricing would have been about three thousand dollars on fuel, um, probably around about the same on food, maybe a little bit more, um, probably a little bit more, probably about three to five. I haven't calculated it all yet for that. And that's just where I stayed. It was basically looking straight down. There's a car park down below, but it's a nice place to have lunch at, breakfast at. Um, touristy places usually don't get. Quite a nice city, and uh, there's a lot of police around here, a lot of security, a lot of police. But it's, uh, yeah, so I basically, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to think of what else. Uh, my, yeah, my motorbike was pretty expensive, only because I had three sets of tyres, so about two, three hundred, three hundred dollars each time, so there's about a thousand dollars on tyres. Um, and then servicing was probably about another two thousand dollars, so, you know. Uh, you know, you've got. I basically serviced it. I serviced it once in Mexico, um, in Mexico City. I serviced it once in um, in Cartagena. Serviced it in Santiago, Chile. Um, I got a little service done, but they did it for free for me. In in because uh, the guys in Cartagena screwed up. Um, in, in another place in Colombia, I'm trying to think of what the city's name is. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I think I had four, four, four services all up, uh, 40, about 40,000 kilometres, 38,000 kilometres or something. Um, so, you know, I kept, I kept the service up regularly and, you know, the, some of them were pretty expensive. The one in San Diego was about $800. But, you know, I, I got to a stage where I, I needed to go to... Well, all of them were verified, actually, yeah, all of them were verified KTM service places, but I also had the issue with my broken rims in, uh, which, you know, that cost me money as well. The broken rims on the Honduras side of the border, which is probably the worst road I've ever come across. It was actually a high, a main one. It was just pothole after pothole. You know, maybe a metre of, of, of flat road, then a pothole, then a metre, and there's cars coming and switching sides of the road everywhere. It was just a nightmare, and I was going too fast and paid the price for that. Uh, this is uh, Porta Vallada. This is the hotel I was staying at. You get, you get annoyed a lot by people trying to sell you stuff too, but you just got to put up with that. But uh, you know, overall, I had a great trip on the ferry. Again, really fresh food, fantastic food. Um, yeah, a really good spot. So yeah, um, as, a, as like always guys, any questions or comments, leave them and I'll answer. Thank you.